All right, this morning, uh, as Pastor Brown has already alluded, I'm going to talk to you about the windows of heaven. I'd planned on the first few weeks that we were here to talk about our beautiful stained glass windows, but have not done so. So here in the year anniversary, it was a year ago, say what, a couple of weeks, that we moved into this uh, magnificent sanctuary for the first time. And uh, I want to talk to you about the three windows and what they mean. I think you see it. I hope it's clear in the middle window. Do we need more lights up there, or gentlemen, or whatever? Uh, to see in the middle window, hear me, follow me, and remember me. Let's bring a little light up there if we can on that. I want everyone to be sure to see that because in our planning, we wanted to build a building so that when people came in, even without anyone here, there would be a message from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you'll notice in your introductory word, if you'll take the outline there in your bulletin, the word windows is used almost 50 times in Scripture. I was amazed at this, 50 times. And I looked at every one of those, selected just a few here who, that would be favorites to me. God put uh, a window, or told Noah to put a window in the ark. It's interesting, isn't it? So he could see out. I like number four down there. Jezebel put on her makeup and looked out the window. Should have stayed inside that day because she was immediately thrown off the balcony and that was her last makeup party. That's an interesting verse to read. Joshua and David both escaped from windows and so did Paul. I'd never noticed that before. Windows are good escapes sometimes. And especially I love the one down toward uh, uh, the bottom, the windows of heaven will pour forth multiple blessings on those who tie their substance to the purposes of God. Well, there's a, a great verse. And then this next one is, I guess, the most humorous, Eutychus. You ever heard of Eutychus? Eutychus was a young boy who was sitting in the window while Paul preached. And the scripture says Paul preached on and on and on till he preached even after midnight and Eutychus fell asleep in the window, fell out the window, was killed. And Paul rushed down and uh, brought him back to life and went back up into the upper room, took Eutychus with him, whose name was Fortunate uh, in the Greek. And then it says Paul preached on the morning. Wow, I guess so. If you bring somebody back from the dead, people listen to you. A long time, we need maybe a few people to die see if we could bring them back from the dead here in the church. I doubt if we would have that power. But Paul preached on. I imagine Eutychus' uh, theme then, like the little boy told his mother and daddy one time, he said, uh, Mom and Dad, the kids in the junior class are going to start calling the preacher Pharaoh. And they said, well, why are you going to call the pastor Pharaoh? I said, because he won't let the people go. <laughs> he keeps them there. Knew there'd be some laughter on that, of course, uh, identifying. But here are all the words on windows. Now, the windows at the UBC sanctuary tell their own story, and they complement these windows mentioned in the Scripture here. The windows on each side are open. It's a little dark outside today, but notice we have natural light. Now, you can come in here, don't have to flip a switch, that the natural light will flood this place. We've always wanted that, God's light, God's natural revelation. You see, there are two revelations that the Bible tells us about. There's natural or general revelation that we all get from nature, from science, from other people. And then there is supernatural or special redemptive revelation that we get just from God. You can move in the world and know what general revelation is all about, but until you look at this book and begin to understand the purposes of God, you never know what specific revelation is all about. So we need to remember that, natural revelation and redemptive revelation. Now, the windows on either side remind us of God's revealing himself to us in nature. These windows here remind us of God's supernatural revelation to us in Jesus Christ. And these three words, hear me, follow me, and remember me, speak of the essential message, the triune message of our Father God. Look at the first window. I've called it here the hear me window, and John 5, 24 is the verse for this middle window. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my words and believes in him who sent me shall have, possess everlasting life, and shall not come into the experience of continuous condemnation like most people do, and shall have the light of life. Beautiful verse. This is the middle window. 
Now notice I was rereading it myself in uh, the book of Exodus chapter 19 and 20. If you want to look at it there, look at the middle window quickly. First of all, in the top left, you see the lightning flashing down from heaven, striking Mount Sinai. And Exodus said that there was thunder and lightning as God spoke and gave his first revelation, unique written revelation to man as he gave Moses the Ten Commandments on top of Mount Sinai. And then we move from there just to the right where you see the Hebrew. There are the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. And Pastor Brown and I uh, got this up and told them what it was in Hebrew. And somehow in the translation, the uh, artist, the person who did this window for us, called back and said they had a Jewish rabbi walk in and he noticed the commandments, but what we had omitted somehow, the no was left off of it. And so rather it says, do not cheat, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not swear. It says, cheat, swear, commit adultery. There it was. I know what you're laughing about. A lot of no's you've left out of your life, right, at this point. So uh, Pastor Brown and I were saved. Barty, I'm sure that was your fault. I mean, uh, what happened there? And so we have the Hebrew Ten Commandments. Now to the left... You see, we have uh, in the Greek, rema keroxen, should put my glasses on here. It's hard for me to read that now. But uh, this is the Word of God. There it is. Rema, the Word of God, kuriu, meno, remains, meni, remains unto the ages. That's what that means in the Greek, that the Word of God remains unto the end of the age. That's from uh, Peter. And then down at the bottom, you see the... Uh, King James Bible open or whatever. In the beginning was the Word, God's Word to us. The menorah, the lighted candlesticks, and choir, I'm sorry, really. I'd already given instructions that we put this on the upper screen, but the screens blew out. So you'll have to trust your memory here and forgive me for that. But you see the menorah, the lighted candle, that was the light that was to be in the tabernacle that would burn forever. It wasn't a candle that would burn out. It had to be constantly refueled with the oil of the Holy Spirit, a great Great lesson for each of us. Nothing will keep you burning except the continuous infilling of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, that's the middle window and uh, what it stands for. Now, let's think about that just a moment. According to Scripture, every person in this place today is a liar. I gave you the words on that in uh, Psalm and John and Romans. You can look it up for yourself. But I want us to look at Mark 10 as the illustration of this great point. The hear me window, we must hear God. Hearing God is everything. If you can't hear God, you're through. Your life will never account, amount to a hill of beans, and you have to hear him for yourself. Kiddos, if you're eight or nine this morning, you can hear the living God at the level of your life. If you're a teenager, you can hear the living God. If you're in your 20s, 30s, 60s, 70s, you, God has given you in you because Christ is in you the capacity to hear God. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say that he has put the Holy Spirit in us everywhere it says about 200 times that Christ is in us. And it's the Christ in us who hears the Holy Spirit and you and I are continually giving ourselves more and more and more to what the Lord Jesus is telling us. My only hope for you and your only hope for me is that I know how to hear God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Sometimes he says nothing. Deanna, I was very touched by your uh, testimony as you prayed for your little boy that you didn't know what was going to happen. And God didn't seem to answer until he did. See, sometimes God says nothing just to see whether we'll keep believing or not. We always want those quick answers. And here we see a marvelous story in Mark 10. This young man ran up to Jesus, fell at his knees, and said, Good teacher. The Lord rebukes him for that. A lot of text here. You see, good was only used in those days in the, Jewish command, in the Jewish days as reserved for God. You just didn't call someone good. And it showed this young man thought of himself as good, and he ran up and talked to Jesus as good. Two good men among a lot of weak people. Teacher, good one is actually what it says in the Greek. And the Lord Jesus rebuked him and said, don't give your flattery titles to me. Even Jesus said that. In other words, the Lord constantly took the focus off of himself and put it back on the Lord Jesus. And I repent, and I tell every one of you all today, forgive me and pray for me if I've ever called attention to myself rather than calling attention to the Lord Jesus. 
With all my heart, that's what I wanted to do. But parents, you failed in the same way. Daddy, mother, you really want to call attention to Jesus and what he's done for you, but so often Jesus gets forgotten and all your child sees is you. And that's bad news. But the Lord said, don't call me good young man. You be sure you know who I am before you start throwing titles about. He'd say the same to many of us. Oh, yes, I believe in the Lord. Oh, yes, I know Jesus. Oh, yes, I'm a follower of the Christ. And Jesus would come today and say, wait a minute. What do you mean by Jesus? What do you mean by Christ? What do you mean by Lord? See, you be careful with the titles that you flippantly throw around about me. And the Lord rebuked him. He said, no, you should not talk about me that lie. Christ, you see, focused on the Lord, on God the Father continuously. Hope only in God. The true teacher always points to the Father. That's what we ought to do. And then verse 20, he says, Teacher, all these things have I kept since I was a boy. Now, do you talk about natural revelation? See, he has done the best a human being could do, but he's not done enough. He said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus knew then he was wrong. There's nothing you can do. You were bankrupt. As I shared a moment ago from the bullet, Larry Crabb, he said, some people say, try harder, try again, try everything, try information. There's nothing you can try that'll do you any good. Eternal life is a gift from the Heavenly Father. It's a gift from Jesus Christ. And you and I must get into the receiving position to say, Lord Jesus, I realize that there is nothing I can do. I am a broken, bankrupt, sinful, fallen child. And so I come on my knees again like this young man, and I don't say, what must I do? I say, Lord, do what you need to do to make me what I need to be. And God gets us in that receiving position. Now, all of us have come to the Lord amiss. We've come with our false desires. In fact, James says that in his little book, you have not because you ask not. The Lord rebuked me about that group again, that, that, that verse again this week. And he says, H.D., there have been people in this city who you're concerned about, and you have prayed for them spasmodically and uh, occasionally to come to Christ. But he brought four or five names to mind, and he says, if you really want them to come into a knowledge of Jesus Christ, then you had better ask me for them daily. And I have put several people down that I'm starting to pray for daily who would come to Christ and receive him as Savior and Lord. So the Lord Jesus said, you better come to me on my terms, not your terms. And yet even then, even though this young man was all messed up, the Lord Jesus said, looked at him and he loved him. Isn't that wonderful? Look at verse 21. And then he said, one thing you lack, one thing. You see, this young man's faith was built on himself and what he had done. And the Lord knew the one thing that day that he lacked was a total abandonment to his past and a total surrender to God. Jesus Christ said, separate yourself from your history and all you've done and become a radical now follower of me unconditionally and do what I tell you to do. Now, my dear friends, that's the voice of the master today as we look at this window. Hear me. What would Jesus Christ say to every one of you if I said I've set up an interview and the Lord has granted me the opportunity over here in the counseling room to have an interview with every single one of you. And if you knew that would be true and that you could go in there, if you had to wait till three or four this afternoon and go in that counseling room, Jesus Christ would look at you. He would say to you what he said to this young man, there's one thing standing in the way of your next step for being my son or my daughter, and here's what it is. Do any of you doubt that? I sure don't. As I prepared this message, the Lord spoke to me about one thing. I said, oh, Lord, don't bring that up. That's the one thing I am going to bring up because that's the one thing standing in the way of your next step for me. And the Lord said five things symbolic of perfect weakness. Go, sell, give, come, follow. Now, that's the message. Go, sell everything you have. Boy, that guy's rich. Just give it away to everyone else. Have nothing to do with it anymore. And you come, be with me, and as I take my step, you follow me. Wow. Almost wish I hadn't found that passage, Pastor Brown, <laughs> to talk about, one, get one a little bit more easier than that one. 
But I guarantee you there is one thing today in every person's life in here that's standing in your way of taking your next step to be obedient to Jesus Christ. What is it? Do you have the courage to ask him? To hear what he says? You may not be a Christian. In groups like this, there's always someone who thinks that they're a believer, but they're not. Christ is not in their life. And you need to say the one thing that's keeping you back today is you have refused to accept the saviorship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you today to do it before you leave. If you're not sure of your salvation and your relationship to Christ, you talk to one of us, one of our elders, one of our staff members, some friend or Sunday school teacher you can trust and determine that one thing, rejection of Christ, is not standing in your way. Most of us here are guilty as Christians of not knowing what Christ wants to do in our life. You don't really want to know. You're afraid of the, what he's going to tell you. What is the one thing? I think we'd be, sh well, I don't know, some of us maybe, but would be shocked at the one thing standing in your way. Are you so proud, are you so deceived to think that you're following Christ at the maximum of your life? That there's nothing standing between you and the Lord that to clear it out would make you a more total surrendered follower of what he wants to do? You can't do it in your own strength. You have to get on your knees and say, Father, what do I do? lack and he'll tell you because he loves us as I said in the prayer he loves us like we are but he loves us too much to let us stay like we are now another comment I'll share with you a minute on why this is so tragic will come as we move on down the line let's look at the second one the follow me window follow me window Mark 1, 17, great verse. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Meaning if we're not fishing for any men, if people are not coming into the stream of the Spirit, if people are not coming into faith in Jesus Christ, we are not following him. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? How long has it been since you engaged anyone in an intelligent, Christ-centered discussion about obedience to the Scripture? How long has it been? If we follow Christ, Jesus said, we will fish, put our efforts out to bring others into his kingdom. Now, look at this window. At the top, you see the round purple globe, north, east, south, and west. That's our commandment, to go to the ends of the earth. We have people from this church all over the world. Thank God for that. You see the dove, symbolic, coming down at the baptism of our Lord Jesus. I'll be baptizing next week in the Jordan River. It's always an exciting moment. I freeze to death, but it's always an exciting moment. Boy, that water's cold. But I still look forward to it. The water symbolizing baptism, the fire of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit, or John the Baptist said, I shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Man. Tonight I'm going to be talking about prayer and the incense on the altar. And it said the incense that offers itself and reaches God is the incense that burns. It has to burn. And as I read that, the Lord rebuked me, said, H.D., your prayers don't burn, son. They're just little ditties. Bless everyone, help the church, hope the offering's all right. When you pray to me, I want to see some burning in your heart. That's what the fire's all about. And there you see at the bottom right the fish. That we are called to go fish in the world and bring them to Jesus Christ. Great thought. Notice what I've said here, Luke 16, 16. Uh, you might write that in under statement number two. I use Matthew 11, 11, but it says the same thing in Luke 16, 16, and I want us to look at that quickly because it's briefer. And the Lord Jesus from his mouth himself says this, Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, but since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached Everyone is forcing his way into it. Good translation. The old King James Version says they take it by violence, but literally the word in the Greek is force. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to make up your mind to force yourself, whatever it takes, even do violent things with your body to make you what you need to be. That's what fasting is all about. Not that we'd lose weight or do some religious exercise. 
It's just a time for you to say, I can control my appetites. I can control my appetites for food. I can control my appetites for pleasure. I can control my appetite for things. I can control my appetite for anything because I belong to Christ. That's what it's all about. And Jesus said there must be violence in this. I'm writing, as I've told some of you, doing a little writing, trying to, and here's what I've written down about this, and here's what I want you to remember about follow me because it's a great point. It's a great truth. Follow me means literally this. Are you listening to me? Force yourself to discover what's in you. You see, when I was born the first time, God placed in me a lot of capacity. I didn't know what that was. I have found out. I always wanted to fly an airplane. I didn't know whether I had the capacity to fly or not. But by committing myself to flight school, I discovered I did. Some of you may be called to be a chemist or to be a musician. You don't know what's in you. You don't know what God has put in you until you force yourself to discover what's in you. And I wrote down to discover what God has put in you. It's there in its miraculous promise, but you must will the steps and endure the heat that forges your soul. Flying was in me, but learning how to fly meant constant pressure, insecurity, Abuse and cursing. Do you remember my flight instructor? You stupid blankety blank. I'd never been cussed at so much in my time. Daily vomiting nausea for me. Every time I went up, I got sick and threw up. I wanted to quit. I had the fear of failure. Every day I knew when I went up, I was going to get a cussing out and I was going to throw up. And I didn't like it. But God said, stick with it. Our instructors or other Christian God's puts into our life. The church is the airplane of spiritual flight. You are dead to everything in you that's destructive. Do you know that? As God's child, you are dead to everything in you that's destructive. But you must be alive to obedience to discover your potential and to defeat the father of lies. Forgive me, but I kind of like that even though I wrote it. You must be alive to obedience. First time God's ever given me that phrase. And that's what following is all about. Now, remembering, remembering the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I love this one. See the word of God on which the lamb sets. There are the seven seals. And there's the bread and the grapes. And, of course, the cup and the crown. I love this one because over the lamb you see two crowns. Choir, you know this. Above the Lord's, the Lamb's head, there's the crown of thorns, and above the crown of thorns is the crown of glory, the kingly crown. And that's what's ahead for us as we remember the Lord. Notice my comments here in number three. The word remember occurs over 275 times in the Bible. I've given you some of them here. And until you really know some of the pain of following Jesus, there's nothing to remember. Isn't that interesting? Nothing to remember. Now think of the scriptures, how filled it is with so many wondrous things. God remembered Noah. God remembered Abraham. God remembered Rachel. Nehemiah said, remember the Lord. David said, I remember you on my bed at night. Paul says, remember Jesus Christ of the seed of David, risen from the dead. The writer of Hebrews said, remember those who are in prison. Remember your leaders who work among you. And the Lord Jesus said, remember me. Wow, what power is in those words. And Luke 22 puts it there. He took the bread, gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to them. Do this often, he said, and remember me when you do it. See? Now let's have the lights in all three windows, gentlemen, because there's one thing that I've left out. You notice there's a cross in every window meaning unless there is cross-hearing, cross-following, there'll be no cross-remembering. And the greatest power in a person's life is to remember Jesus Christ, your Savior, your Lord, your lover, your leader, your prince, 
your governor, your king, your savior, your friend, the one who ever lives to make intercession for you and you and you. Oh, what a savior we have. My dear friends, I beg of you in the name of Christ and all that's holy, come alive to what he's put in you. Do you think I could have been a pilot or someone could be a chemist or a doctor or a professional or a musician without dying to something else and alive to that? And that's why the Bible is full of it. Paul says, I die daily so that Christ's life can be manifested in me. What's before us? Two choices. Hear God or dumb down. What are you going to do? We're a pretty smart group here, aren't we, by the Holy Spirit? What one thing is standing in the way of your next step? What do you need to get tough on in your life? saying, I'm going to force myself to pray. I'm going to force myself, whatever. I'm going to get violent if I have to, to be a follower of the master. And this last, what are you remembering that you ought to let go? The past is over. The future's mystery. Christ in the moment is how we live.